Good morning again. I think I'm the kind of musically challenged, but uh, at least playing wise, I played the piano when I was a kid, but stopped that pretty soon. But I believe that was a fiddle, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that. So that was pretty cool. Uh, great song. Um, well, good morning. I hope you're doing well, staying safe. Um, this Sunday is um, the Sanctity of Life Sunday. You might have seen it on the weekly update that was sent out. We also have it on the overhead here. But um, Karen Nate, one of our um, wonderful ministries that we support, uh, they have a little flyer that went out. I just wanted to read um, a portion of that um, as we kind of celebrate today. Uh, since 1984, a nation has designated the third Sunday in January, which is today, as National Sanctity of Life Sunday, a day to celebrate God's gift of life, to commemorate the many lives lost to abortion, and commit to the protection of human life at all stages. Our goal at CareNet is to offer a judgment-free space for factual, loving conversations about pregnancy, abortion, and adoption. Karen, it's just amazing ministry that ministers to women and families um, as they make these incredibly difficult decisions um, and walking with them in a way that is um, godly, that is Christian, and just being there as advisors. Um, so we thank you for your, your support for that ministry. I want to thank Cindy for her really devoted uh, ministry and work with Care Not. So thank you. Um, also, I encourage you to look at our announcements page. We have announcements that go out after on Sunday with all um, the things coming up. And it's amazing. We're, I mean, we're getting all the way halfway through January. I feel, I feel like we're still in December. I don't know why, but things are moving <laughs> moving ahead. And finally, in February, we'll have Groundhog Day and Valentine's Day. So um, hint, fellas, if you got your uh, Valentine, you got a whole other month to get your uh, Valentine's Day sweethearts um, gifts. So I just want to let you know about that. Um, <laughs> so um, today we're going to be getting a new a series called A Faith That Works. How can we have faith in this world, a faith that we can um, trust in, that we can get through good, good times and bad times? Um, now, many of us know all about what it means to have a personal faith with God for salvation, that we maybe when we're a little kid or older or whenever, we trusted in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We placed our faith in him, and we decided to walk with him and follow him. But that is just really the beginning of the adventure of the Christian life. That kind of gets you in to the story. We talked about running the race last week, and that kind of gets you, that's kind of like when the, you know, the starting gun goes off. And so now you're entered into the life of um, faith, and how does that faith work? And we need a faith that works. We need a faith to please God. The Hebrew, uh, the author of Hebrews in chapter 11, verse 6, says that it is impossible to please God without faith. Without placing our faith in him, without having trusting in God for the things that we need, we're really kind of not pleasing him. Faith is that feeling and that emotion, and also it is declaring to the world and to God that I trust in you regardless of what's going on in my circumstances. So in order to live the Christian life, we need a faith that works throughout our lives. Some of us, um, you know, we place our faith in Jesus and then we kind of do our own thing and we kind of forget it. And then when God, and we're going through a really difficult situation, we cry out to God and say, God, I've um, come to you in faith and I'm placed, I place my faith in you for, for salvation. And I'm trusting you that I'm going to follow you. And now I've got a really tough time, so I need you. And then God comes and, and he works with you and he helps you through the difficult, um, trying time. And when you get through it, it's like, okay, God, I appreciate your help. Now I've got it from here. And so the Christian life becomes kind of a every day um, or a periods of time where you're kind of crying out to God, I'm going through a rough period. Please come and help me. But when you're done, I've got it from here. The Christian life is more about believing and trusting in God every day of our lives, making decisions based upon what God wants us to do and trusting in him, having a faith that works both in good times and bad times. When, we have a, when we're going through a good times, how many of us are blessing God and praising him for what he's, he's done and, and maybe taking a step in faith? That's a great time for us to grow. And God uses all the situations in our life to help us grow in our Christian walk. Because it's really, the Christian life is all about being conformed to Christ. 
Otherwise, he would have saved you and raptured you right up to heaven so you can enjoy, you know, being with God. But no, he wants you to stay on earth because he has a plan for you. He has a purpose. He saved you for something. And part of that life is trusting in God and having a life of faith, a faith that works. We need a faith that we can count on when all else seems lost. Now, what is faith and what does it mean to have faith? Last week, we looked at the book of Hebrews about how we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. And then how the author defines faith. These are things we looked at last week. Remember, we defined faith as the reality of what is hoped for and the proof of what is not seen. Faith is a way of seeing. It's like putting your heavenly goggles on, your your spectacles, your glasses, and seeing the world as he sees it. It's seeing, uh, faith is kind of a way of looking at your situation, looking at the world, looking at your relationships from God's point of view. Obviously, we're not God. We're not going to be able to see exactly how he sees us, but he wants us to have that frame of mind that we are so close to Christ that we are living out our Christian life. And so when we look at things and situations and people, we're looking at them how God sees them, how God wants us to look at our situation and our problems, to trust in him for the things that we need. Faith is being certain of things we do not see. There is a world that we cannot see that is there. And the reason we cannot see is because we don't have a resurrected body yet that is able to see that world. And the world that we can't see is actually more real than the one that we are in currently. Faith is what we need in order to live this Christian life. And faith is all about learning how to see things from God's point of view. I have a situation in my life, I have a work um, situation where things are just not going well. I have a boss that I don't um, get along with for whatever reason. How can I interact with this person in a godly way? How can I trust that if I become uh, nice to this person, if I act like a Christian towards them, that things are going to be okay? Because in this world, usually it's, you know, aggressive. And the people who are get ahead are the ones who you know, take that step forward, who push people aside and, hey, I'm going to do my own thing. I don't care who I hurt in the process. The Christian life is a lot different than that. It's about coming alongside people and loving them and loving our neighbor in spite of the way the world wants us to be. And part of faith in those environments is trusting that when we are obeying God, that we're going to be okay. It's that when your boss comes to you and says, you know, I want you to do this. I want you to make that sale. And I don't care what you have to do, even if you have to do something that is immoral, I want you to make the sale. That is your job. And if you don't do that, I'm going to fire you. What does a Christian do in that experience? Christian that experience needs to trust in God, to have faith and say, I can't do that. I'm going to make this sale and I'm going to do it a Christian way. I'm going to leave all the consequences of that obedience to him, trusting that even if I get fired, he will find me a job that's even better than the one I just left. That is faith. That is faith. Putting our Christian walk first in every situation in life. Many people think that faith is what you believe in in the absence of proof. So I'm just going to believe it because I want to. We talked about last week, you know, you walk outside and you look up in the sky and you say, boy, it's so beautiful out here. I love this purple sky. It doesn't matter how much you believe that or want to believe that, the sky is still blue. I have a mask here on my podium that I just took off as I came here. Now, what about if I thought that that was a cell phone? I believe I trust that this little thing here that's got straps and keeps, my, you know, keeps me from getting the, the, va- uh, the virus, I think that this is a cell phone. And I'm going to believe in it, and I'm going to trust in it, and I'm going to place my faith in it. You know what? No matter how much you believe that a mask is a cell phone, it's a mask. There's nothing you can do. 
Your belief is not going to transform this mask into a cell phone. So it's not about the burden of proof or I can't figure this out, so I'm just going to have faith and take a leap in the dark and hope that everything is going to be okay. Faith is actually trust in verifiable evidence. Jesus rose from the dead. There is overwhelming historical evidence for the resurrection. And that is why we can place our faith in it. We are not believing in nonsense. We are believing in truth. We trust that Jesus rose from the dead because we have people who have said he has, that the scriptures testify to that. That people were there and witnessed it. That it changed people's lives. That there was an empty tomb. That nobody could present the body. These are verifiable evidences for the resurrection. And I can go on and on and on. So I can trust that Jesus rose from the dead. And because he rose from the dead, we're here today. Because as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus did not raise from the dead, your faith is futile. Because then you're putting your faith into nonsense. If I put water into a tray, I stick it in the freezer, I trust that when I take it out in the morning, it's going to be frozen. Why? Because it's happened before. I've seen it happen. I can verify it. If I put a, uh, water into a tray and I expect and I have faith that it's going to come out looking like butter, then I'm putting my faith in nonsense. So this is important. Faith is knowing that something will happen in the future because God has promised it would happen. Even though that right now in the present, it looks extremely bleak. And why can we trust in the future? Because we're putting our trust in God. God has always been there for his people. He has never let them down. He is always faithful. You can trust in him. He is the one who can bring you through any situation. And so we know, we place our faith in him, and we trust that if we take a step in faith, we tell our boss, I just can't do that. I'm, I'm a Christian, and I can't do what you're telling me to do because it's immoral. You're taking a stand. You're placing your faith in God, knowing that he will be with you, that he will help you through this process because he's helped you through it before. He's not a God of lies. He's a God of truth. Faith is knowing what will happen in the future in the midst of our present circumstances and our present situation being awful. And we can still trust in God for what we're supposed to do in the future because we know who he is. I have faith because God has kept his promises in the past. If you're wondering if God will keep his promises to you, go back and begin reading the Bible from Genesis chapter 1. Over and over and over again, God is faithful to his people even when they are not faithful to him. You can trust in him. There are over 7,000 promises in the Bible. And that God has told you that these will happen if you trust in him. If you have faith that works. If there's one thing that we need in this world right now is people who have a strong faith in Christ. Not just for salvation. That's important. Don't get me wrong. Becoming a Christian is one of the most amazing things that will ever happen to you. It's the best decision you can ever make in life. But also, we need people who have faith, strong faith that works in everyday life. We need to have faith every day. We need to trust in him for everything that we do. For the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at closely at the book of James. And James is one of those amazing books it's got five chapters, 100, about 100 verses, and they're very, very small, but it provides practical evidence, practical advice and principles for people who are living through difficult times. So I, I really implore you over the next several weeks to just kind of be reading through James every week. It should not take you more than 15, 20 minutes. If you're a speed reader, you could probably read it in five minutes. 
but walk through it and spend time with it and you'll, your life will be different. Your faith will be challenged. James is the half-brother of Jesus and the leader of the Jerusalem church, Mary, um, obviously, you know, Jesus was her um, first child and obviously have, you know, the Immaculate Conception. But Mary went on and had other kids with Joseph after Jesus came on the scene. And one of them was James. And James became the leader of the Jerusalem church, which is the first Christian community ever. A group of people who were in Jerusalem surrounded by Romans and Jews who all both were trying to get at them and persecuting them. Many were cut off from others. They were in the diaspora. They were living um, in a different area. And James, as the leader of really the Christian church at that time, was telling people spread out all over the territory that you can be faithful witness in the midst of your circumstances. Even though you're living under persecution, you can have a faith that works for any situation. These people were really going through a really difficult time. I mean, they were persecuted. They were harassed. They were socially disconnected from each other. Does that sound familiar? In James's world, you could literally be killed by the Romans for being a follower of Jesus. Later in the Roman Empire, they used to take Christians and round them up and put them into the Colosseum and have them fight lions or gladiator fights for entertainment. The Romans used Christians for entertainment. Like we watch football on Sundays, they would watch Christians go at it with swords as a way to have entertainment. They were going through really difficult persecution. These people could be killed for their faith. And so they were running for their lives. They were trying to stay alive uh, all the while while they were trying to live out their Christian life. How do we live our Christian life when there are people out there trying to kill us because we are Christians? It's a lot different than make those risks of faith when it may cost you your life. Their lives had been turned upside down. They felt alone. They felt cut off from others, even their loved ones. James writes them this letter to encourage them, to help them, and to do what? To challenge them to live out their Christian faith. Even while they are suffering, even while they're going through difficulty, even while they're being persecuted, they are to trust in God for everything they need. I mean, just go through and start looking at James from chapter 1, verse 1, and read to the end of the book, the letter. Read through the whole thing in one sitting, and I can promise you that your faith will be challenged. James wants his readers to learn what kind of faith is needed and what kind of faith that works when your life has been turned upside down. So today we're going to begin um, our series on how to have a faith that works. And this this morning, we're going to mostly um, um, specifically more look on how to have a faith that works to help us to endure difficulties. So we're going to be looking at James 1, um, looking at the first 11 verses. So if you have a Bible, you can look on the overhead or whatever you have at home um, to look through that. So let me, um, I'm going to take a little commercial break and then we'll kind of get back into it. This is sponsored by Poland Spring Water. (laughs) I'd probably have to pay them money now, but um, look at James, starting of James um, chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, the 12 tribes dispersed abroad. Greetings. Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting, for the doubter is like the surging sea, driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of humble circumstances boast in his exaltation, But let the rich boast in his humiliation because he will pass away like a flower of the field. 
For the sun rises and together with the scorching wind dries up the grass. Its flower falls and its beautiful appearance perishes. In the same way, the rich person will wither away while pursuing his activities. Let us pray. Father, we're so thankful for this amazing letter and this amazing person um, of faith, James, who led this um, church in Jerusalem and actually died for his faith and was killed. And we thank you for this amazing testimony that we have that we can go back to again and again and to um, find your riches in this wonderful letter. I pray, God, that this message will come um, from you, that the words that come out of my mouth will be pleasing to you. I pray for everyone here that they will listen to what God has um, for them to hear and to put that in practice and have faith and obedience in what they've learned today. In your name we pray, amen. Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials. James tells us two things that we need to know about trials and difficulties here. First, they're unavoidable. There's really nothing we can do. They're going to happen. I don't think you can ever live your life without having your car break down at least once or taking it to the mechanic at least once. Even if you have a new car, at some point, you're going to have to take it to the mechanic. It's unavoidable. James does not say if trials happen, but when they happen. There is no way to stop difficulties and troubles in your life. They will happen. It's just part of life. You, and also, you can't schedule them when you will go through trials. God, you know, I can't deal with this right now. I mean, I've got a free day on Tuesday, so if we can postpone this trial until Tuesday, when I have more time to deal with it, I'd really appreciate it. That doesn't work that way. Have you ever noticed that trials seem to kind of hit you when you're the most busy at the, at the worst possible time? You know, you're, you're running out the door to, to meet someone for, you know, a meeting. And next thing you know, your toilet begins to overflow or, or you know, something falls from your, um, you find something drops on your head. Oh, my ceiling is now has, a, my roof is about to have a leak. And what am I going to do? And it seems that everything happens at once. Troubles are unavoidable. They're all part of living in a fallen world. From the time that Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, we had troubles. And they were unavoidable. There's no way around that. They're kind of like a, a required course of life. When you, know, when you get to a certain age, they should give you a manual and say, you're going to have troubles. Here's how you handle them. And that's kind of what the book of James is really all about. Here's how you handle life of faith. Here's how you walk your faith in everyday life. This is what James is all about. So their trials and difficulties are just required course. You can't opt, opt out of trials. I don't want those things, give them, leave them away, I'll do whatever I can to, you know, how much do I have to pay God in order to get rid of trials? It, you can't opt out of them. They're always going to be there. If we try, and here's the thing is, if we try to live our lives attempting to avoid troubles, I promise you, you will live a life of frustration and defeat. Some of us here do, are avoid any kind of difficulty that we may encounter because we don't like what happens to us when it happens. And so we live our lives trying to stay away from difficulties if you've ever watched the movie um, from Jack Nicholson, it's a, I just completely had a, a brain, whatever, and I forgot the name of the movie. But he plays this obsessive, compulsive guy, and he's always constantly trying to live without difficulty. I mean, he washes his hands 25 times a day, and, and he doesn't want to step on any kind of cracks on the road, and he doesn't want to talk to anybody, and he doesn't want to interact with anybody. And so the whole movie is about him kind of having to deal with the fact that he's going to have to just accept life. And so we have people in this world who do not want anything bad to happen and do whatever they can to make sure the trials and difficulties don't come. So they really never grow. They stay stationary. They don't use the faith that God has given them because they are afraid of taking a risk and obeying God. There is no way that we can keep difficulties and trials from coming to us. They will just happen. It's just part of life. 
So the first thing here is that they're unavoidable. There is nothing we can do to avoid them. Second, we're going to have various trials, meaning that they're going to come in all kinds of colors, shapes, and sizes. Some trials we can handle pretty quickly. Other ones just seem to be constantly there. Some will come with great intensity, super difficulties, super trials that will really drain us and we'll feel like, how am I going to get through this? It's so much pressure that we're going to feel like there's a, we're in the middle of a vice being pressed together. Others will come, like other trials will come in difficulties that will kind of be like a continuous drop of water on our heads. Kind of a, why do we have to keep dealing with this issue that seems to pop up all the time? Others will come and stay over for a while in your life. They'll come and they'll kind of take up residence. Hey, can I camp out here for a while? Trials and difficulties are unavoidable and they come in all kinds of colors, shapes, sizes, intensities. So how do we, the question is not how do we avoid them, but how do we respond to trials and difficulties when they do show up? Consider it a great joy when my brothers and sisters, when you experience various trials. Wait a second here, James. How can we possibly respond with joy when we go through a difficulty? How can we possibly be joyful? Oh boy, I'm so grateful and so glad that I have a difficulty. Bring it on, God. Now, remember what joy is. Joy is a state of being rather than a temporary emotion. Happiness comes and goes, but joy should be there through it all. Joy is contentment in the midst of circumstances because we know that God will get us through it, that he will help us be there in the process of trying to deal with it, and he will help us to mature and help us to grow in our integrity. So how can we have joy in the midst of trials? Now, make sure you understand this. He's not saying be excited about trials. He's not calling us to be masochistic. He's not trying, oh boy, bring on the punishment and pain. What he says here in verse 3 is the reason why we can have joy in the midst of our trials. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. You can have great joy in the midst of difficulties because James says that when you are going through that, that you will know that God has a purpose for your life. See, God says, this trial is going to happen, but when you go through it, you're going to have joy because there is something that he is going to bless you with at the end. Either you're going to grow closer to him, grow closer to someone else, or he will bless you in some other way. He will test your faith and will produce endurance. And so what happens in the Christian life is the more you place your faith in God for for, um, circumstances and situations, and you get through that, then when, it's not like, hey, I got through my trial, so I've gone and gotten my, you know, my testing time away. No, those things will come throughout life. And so what God is doing is he'll test you. He'll say, um, I want you to be strong in this circumstances. I want you to have faith in the midst of this and know that the next time it comes up, you'll be better than it was before because you've gotten through that experience and you can trust in me and obey me even better because you got through it before. God allows his children to go through trials because that is really the only way that he can grow and test your faith and test your integrity. If everything was hunky-dory all the time in the Christian life, we wouldn't grow at all. We wouldn't take chances. We wouldn't take risks. We wouldn't trust in God. Things would be wonderful. We'd just place our faith in Jesus and just live a wonderful, perfect life until God calls us home. So what happens in life is because we live in a dark world, trials and difficulties will come, and that is how God uses those things to grow you closer to him. The word here, test, in the Greek, has a connotation of putting something through the refiner's fire. God allows you to go through difficulties and trials so that he can put you to the test, put you through the fire, which will burn off impurities and make your faith stronger. 
That really is the whole heart of it. When you place your faith in Jesus, as you, when you trust in him that first time for salvation, you're this ugly lump of clay that hasn't been worked on yet. It's just sitting here. And what God does is through his life is he um, pushes it around and he forms it into a beautiful cup and he puts it through the fire and he burns off impurities. And when the heat of that burns down that clay, it comes out of the furnace and it's beautiful. And then he spends time, you know, painting that cup and making it look beautiful on the outside. And then when you come to him, he can present you before the throne as a child of him, perfectly wonderful and complete. That is really the heart of the Christian life. When a blacksmith makes a sword, he puts it through metal. He puts the metal through an extremely hot fire or furnace until it glows red hot. He then removes it from the, from the heat and he plunges it into the water and then he bangs on the metal with a hammer, making it stronger clearing away the impurities, and the more that you temper and um, hit and harden a sword, the stronger it gets. And that's what happens in our Christian faith. The more we go through trials, the more we get through them, the more we place our faith in him for, during those situations, the stronger we will become in our walks with God. This is how our trust and faith grows. This is what God wants us to do. The more your faith grows, the more you will be able to endure difficulties. This is why I think one of the best ways to to kind of walk through the Christian life is to have a journal and and talk to God about what's going on in your life. And then you might look back on a year ago and go, boy, I went through a really dark time there. How did I ever get through that? Because what I'm going through now is even worse. and I'm actually doing better than I was a year ago. And you can see how you're progressing in life. So joy is all about a choice that we have when we go through trials. Joy is based on faith. God is not calling us to enjoy difficulties. He's not calling us to be masochistic. James wants us to consider it a great joy when God allows you to go through difficulties. Why? Because it makes your faith in him Stronger, And that is really the whole point of the Christian life. And the stronger your faith is, the more you will obey him, the more you will trust him. Faith and obedience go together. And they can only grow when, they're, when you are going through trials and fiery ordeals. As Rick Warren puts it, when you're going through hell, you keep going. When you're going through hell, you do not stop there. When your situation and your difficulty is burning you up inside, you don't sit there and just go, well, I guess I'm stuck in this situation. No, you go through it. You go through your difficulty. You trust in God that he will get you through it because he's gotten you through it before. The only way to get through difficulty is to meet it head on and to get through it, trusting in God, enduring whatever comes your way, knowing that Jesus is there and walking with you through it. He doesn't leave you alone. The ultimate reason you go through trials is so that you can become mature and complete. James wants his readers to be strong Christians who have a faith that works to help them endure difficulties, that makes people of impeccable character and integrity. Look at verse 4. And let endurance have its full effect. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. You'll get endurance. And endurance will do what? So that you may be mature and complete, lacking in Nothing. Jesus wants his followers to be men and women of integrity. What does it mean to have integrity? It means that you live a completely integrated life. Your actions are consistent with your values and your beliefs of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Many of us live a fractured life with lots of big inconsistencies in our character. We have learned to kind of compartmentalize our lives. So we live a certain way at home. We live a certain way at work. We live a certain way with our Christian friends, and then we live a certain life with our non-Christian friends, and we live a certain life with our, how we live at church. And so we have all these different compartments and we kind of like a chameleon that we change wherever we go 
and we adapt to whatever environment we come in contact with. And so a lot of times our Sunday self is a lot different than our Monday through Saturday self. James wants us to be whole, complete, mature, which means lacking in nothing. We know that we, we are in Christ, that we can live out a consistent way no matter what environment or situation we are currently in. We have integrity, character. So that when you go to work, you're acting like a Christian at work and you're doing whatever you think you need to do to live out your Christian walk in that life. But when you're with non-Christians, you don't change. You continue to be faithful to God. You continue to walk that Christian life even when you're among people who may not be doing that or even agreeing with the lifestyle that you're leaving. James wants us to have a faith that works, that helps us to endure difficulties. But what happens when we're going through life and we're not sure how to get through this difficulty? We don't know. We, we're kind of trapped. We hit a brick wall. We're like, God, I don't know how to get through this. I've trusted in you. It's been a while. And I just feel like I can't get over this hump. This difficulty just seems to be stuck there. What do I do? This is when we need to ask for wisdom. Verse 5, now if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly and will be given to him. Let us ask him in faith without doubting. For the doubters is like the surging sea driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. When we are going through trials and difficulties, we need to do what? Stop. Stop. Take a deep breath and ask God for wisdom. I can promise you, when you ask God for wisdom, he will give it to you. He's not going to say, ah, sorry, not going to deal with that anymore. I can't give you my wisdom today. I'm all, you know, spent out. Or I've got to deal with this other situation. No, he will give you wisdom. It says here, None, uh, none, now if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who does what? Who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly. So what do we need to do? We need to stop and ask God for wisdom. We need to relax and trust in God. Don't panic, pray, don't worry. Ask God, what can I learn from this situation that I'm going in? That is the most important question that you should ask when you're going through any difficulty. What do you want me to learn, God, about this situation, about myself, about how I interact with other people, about how I can grow in my walk, whatever it is. Ask him to teach you something through this process. That's why he brings it to you. That's why he allows it. Satan wants to use difficulties to defeat you. God wants to use these things to develop your faith and your integrity and your character. See, uh, difficulties and trials are not kind of a, a way to make us feel horrible all the time and make us feel lost and feel like, oh my gosh, how am I going to get through life? No, difficulties are our opportunity. They're an opportunity for us to grow in our relationship with the Lord, to grow in our faith, to trust him, to obey him. So just ask God for wisdom. Verse six, but let him ask in faith without doubting. For the doubter is tossed by the wind. If you've ever been out in a boat in a strong wind and you're kind of on the boat like this, tossed around and about, and you don't know where to go and you're, okay, God, I'm asking for wisdom, but I'm not really sure if you're going to be able to help me because I'm not really sure because and you're doubting God and you're not sure about God. So God does not want you to be constantly tossing back and forth about, okay, I need to trust him. No, I got to solve this on my own. No, God is not the kind of God that I can follow. Boy, he's really let me down before. Uh, do I plus my trace in him? You see, we, we play these mental gymnastics to where we kind of psych ourselves out of the whole situation. So he wants you to ask in faith, God, I'm going to trust in your wisdom, whatever that is. I am willing and ready to accept whatever you tell me in prayer, but how I should handle this situation, even if I don't like it. Verse seven, that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. If we are asking in doubt, it means that our faith is not where it needs to be. 
So we ask in faith, God, I really am going through a difficult situation. I'm actually upset at you because I'm going through a situation and I don't know why. Why do I deserve this situation? But I'm asking for wisdom from you because I can trust in you because you have brought me through life before and I know you will bring me through life now. Don't doubt. Just ask in wisdom. Verse 8. Do not be a double-minded or unstable in your ways. Don't doubt. Don't be one of those people who are constantly going back and forth. See, a double-minded person is one who is soul is divided between the world and faith. What happens when we go through difficulties is sometimes we lapse back into doing what we did before. Sometimes things that may have gotten us into trouble, and we do that because it's comfortable. We want to kind of blend in. We want to live a compartmentalized life. I'm not going to do... I'm not going to do, God, what you're telling me because the situation and the circumstances are making it very uncomfortable for me to do that. See, now we've got the world that's kind of got their stick in there and they're pulling and tugging on you. And God says, you have to look to me and trust in me regardless of what the world is telling you, regardless of what your boss is trying to do and trying to tell you to do immorally. Verse 8 really kind of echoes the words in the Sermon on the Mount about the fact that you can't serve two masters. You can't be double-minded. You can't have those two angels, proverbial two angels on your life, one moving you towards God and the other one moving you towards the world, and you're constantly trying to figure out, where do I go? God, James is telling his people that you need to trust in God, even if you think that that might not lead the way you hope it will. Trust in God. We must love Christ with an undivided heart. People who are unstable in all their ways, Craig Blomberg, New Testament scholar, illustrates this concept beautifully. These are people, so an unstable person in all their ways, are people who are unwilling to let go of the world and fully follow and trust Christ. They are torn between sin and obedience, reluctant to let go of the pleasures of the world for the sake of discipleship. Some of us want to stay in the world, but get the blessing of going to salvation. It doesn't work that way. We can't have our cake and eat it too. The whole book of James is about we need to make sure that your faith is true. And one whose faith is true for salvation will be true in life. You can't just place your faith in Jesus and say, I can't wait to live like a pagan until you call me home. It doesn't work that way. Because if you do that, you really have no faith at all. Save, saving faith is everyday faith, is trusting in God for those things that we need. So don't let go of Christ. Hold on to him. Don't allow the pressures of the world to drag you away. How we respond to difficulties will tell us a lot about our strength and faith. If we are going through difficulties and we feel like we're being pushed away from God and running to the world, then we've got some faith practices to do. We've got to go back to a faith 101 and maybe ask ourselves, have I truly come to Jesus? Because I can do that at an altar call at church, but then when I have to live out that faith in life, I am not acting like a Christian at all. Well, maybe the reason that that is happening is because maybe you are not a Christian at all. Are we going to make mistakes? Yes. But what God wants us to do is to be faithful followers of Jesus and trust in him, being people of integrity without doubting, without lacking anything. Life is full of trials and difficulties. They will come no matter what. And so how we respond to them is really what is most important. We can have joy even in the midst of our difficulties because we know that God is with us. He is standing right there alongside. He is really walking with you through them. You're not alone. And because we know that God is with us, the difficulties in life will do what they will help us to grow in our faith in Christ and trust faith to lead to obedience and endurance. 
That is what God wants us to do. When we place our faith in him the first time, whether you were a kid or older or whatever, you began to run that race in life. And you're not going to meet the finish line until God calls you home. And so what God does is he puts situations in your life so that you can constantly show him that you have trusted not only in Christ for salvation, but in everyday life. Everyday life. Because if we can't do that, then we really don't have any faith at all. We cannot have our cake and eat it too. Difficulties will either make us bitter or better. And it's really our choice how we respond to these difficulties. We can have joy. And see, the more we respond in faith to difficulties, the more we will become people of Christian character and integrity. Let us pray. Father, we are just so thankful for this amazing um, letter that James wrote and the wonderful message here that we can have joy even in the midst of our situation because we know that when we go through those and our test, our, our faith will be tested and go through a fire and when we go out of that fire, our faith will be complete restored and perfect. And we look forward to the day that you call us home, that we can be with you. But while we are in this life, help us to continue to have our faith grow and get stronger and be purified and be complete, lacking in nothing. I pray, God, for all of us in this room that we will become more like you, that we will become um, people of Christian character and integrity, that when we go out in the real world, that we're not going to be kind of living compartmentalized lives, that we'll be able to focus on you and be complete and whole. We thank you for your many blessings. In your name we pray, amen.